Well, uh, today we're going to uh, discuss uh, Bible interpretation. As the uh, slide there shows, what does the Bible mean? We're going to look at that. And uh, by the way, there's a, if you go to studywithsteve.wordpress.com, you can pick up the, my notes that I have and charts that I have here. And uh, also, the, there'll be a video out there as well on this. Um, the uh, Bible interpretation is just, I couldn't say it any better than that. Uh, that's, that, that says it all. Um, <laughs> but if you don't interpret the Bible correctly, it could sound like that. <laughs> so that was great. Uh, it's, it's an extremely important topic. And uh, because there's so, how do we know how to figure out what the Bible means? And a lot of people look at the Bible and they go, I just can't, it's just so much, so complicated. Uh, you know, I've, I've been doing the end time study uh, for many years. If I didn't follow certain rules of interpretation, I couldn't build that study. I have to, I have to abide by certain laws that are there. Just like they couldn't have gotten to the moon without trusting physical laws that God created, that things would happen the way they thought they would happen. And, um, and so studying the Bible uh, and studying it in a way to, to draw out the, the right, true meaning is extremely important. Uh, one of the books that I have used through the years that has helped me um, I'm going to put a plug to this. I've got some quotes here from this man, Walt Henriksen. But A Layman's Guide to Interpreting the Bible by Walter A. Henriksen. And uh, that's spelled H-E-N-R-I-C-H-S-E-N. -E um, I think this book is so good that I made sure Lori and Sean got a copy. And all my kids have a copy of the book. And, uh, and hopefully all my grandkids will get a copy of the book. It's, it's, very, it's a layman's guide, just as it says. It's easy to follow, to pick up how to study the Bible, and especially how to, how to interpret Scripture following certain laws. So I highly recommend it. And by the way, it's out of print. <laughs> but you can buy it on the used market on Amazon. That's where I've been picking them up. So, so for about $7, including shipping, you can have this book. Literally, that's all it takes. And uh, so I highly recommend it. Um, the, uh, here's a warning. Uh, and we've got to take heed to this. If, if an individual can make the Bible say what he wants it to say, then the Bible cannot guide him. Uh, it merely is a weapon in his hands to support his own ideas. And we can see that, that you have all kinds of factions and weird stuff that has uh, uh, percolated to the top that uh, through the years uh, that that you know you might look at it and go well uh, that's crazy how did they get to that but you know many of them started with the Bible and because they have not heeded the laws of interpretation they've made it say what they want to say and and so they end up with going off on crazy tangents and, and it could lead to disastrous results. The um, Bible interpretation, uh, you've, um, you've heard the term hermeneutics, uh, a fancy word, a Greek word, meaning uh, means to interpret or translate, whether it's verbal or nonverbal communication. Or you've heard another fancy word called exegesis, uh, meaning to draw out the meaning of something, another Greek word. Uh, Fancy words, but it just comes down to Bible interpretation, following uh, laws of interpretation. So what is the, what's the goal or the aim in, in studying the Bible? You know, it's, it's um, we want to study it, we want to be able to interpret it, and we want to be able to apply the Bible correctly. And the, the primary aim of interpretation is determine the correct meaning of a passage. It only has one meaning. It can't have multiple meanings, otherwise you have multiple, well, I think it means this, and I think it means that. No, it has one meaning. We have to figure out what is that meaning. And uh, 
just as Paul exhorted Timothy, uh, you know, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, and key on that part, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that word rightly dividing, it, it literally means to make a precise cut. And uh, so like a stonemason making precise cuts that, that so it fits exactly the way it should. If anybody's a carpenter in here, to make precise cuts, that if it isn't precisely cut, it, it, it doesn't fit right. And so Paul is exhorting Timothy in his second letter to him. He's about to die. And, and there's all kinds of false doctrine in the church that are going, that's going on in Ephesus. And he's exhorting them, you need to make right cuts in the scriptures. You need to interpret it exactly correct so that those who you're teaching know the right meaning that God intended. And so, just as Paul exhorted him, we should all be exhorted to do the same thing and to figure out what are those laws to make those right cuts uh, as we go along. Um, a couple of assumptions. Uh, let's, let's look at. Uh, assumption, a must assumption number one is work from the assumption that the Bible is authoritative. In other words, uh, it has the, the, it, the Word of God has the ultimate power to determine what is true and real in all that it says. It is the ultimate source. Of, of truth. When Jesus got done speaking in the Beatitudes, they said, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They recognized when Jesus taught um, on the Sermon on the Mount that he spoke with authority because he's God. And so they, under, they could see that this is, this is just not merely man's talking. Uh, man's speech, it's, it's the, it is God speaking, it has authority. And so unless we are willing to place ourselves under the authority of God's Word, we're going to struggle with Bible interpretation. Because we're not going to necessarily be happy with what it says and want to make it, make it say something else in order to make what our lifestyle fit. Are we seeing that happening today? You know, with the focus on same-sex marriage and, and all that, that's going on, it comes down to what is ultimately the final authority. It's God's Word. And uh, now what goes hand in hand with, with this first assumption is that, that the Word of God is inspired. It is, it is God-breathed. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, I'll read it to you. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for an instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be truly furnished unto every good work. And so we believe in the inspiration of Scripture. It goes hand in hand with authority. If we didn't think it was inspired by God, then there'd be no basis to say it's an authority over us. And, um, and so we... Uh, intellectually I accept and I know that it is the Word of God uh, and that I will place my, my His authority over me. You know, there's an interesting verse in John 7:17. 7, Jesus said, If a man will do his Father's will, if a man will do his Father's will, in other words, submit yourself to the authority of God, he shall know the, uh, of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. He will know it is the inspired Word of God when we do it. And so all of us, when we have submitted ourselves to God's authority by following the Word of God, all of us can testify in here, it is the Word of God. It is inspired. And, and all of us have, who have asked Jesus to save us, and we've made that decision to place ourselves under the authority of His redemption plan, putting our personal trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, and have experienced the born-again new life, have experienced the fact that we know it is the inspired Word of God. I am a changed person. I am different because of what God has done in His Word. And uh, so that's assumption number one. Assumption number two is... Uh, to be guided 
correctly by the Word of God, we must uh, assume the Bible contains its own laws of interpretation, which, when properly understood and applied, will yield correct meaning to a given passage. That we, there has to be laws that we have to obey in Bible interpretation to make sure we stay on the right path, we make the right cuts through Scripture to get the exact meaning that's there. If we don't have those laws, then we can all do whatever we want to in our own eyes. It's wonderful to have the Word of God, but like, I, like Henriksen said, it could become a weapon if we don't apply the laws correctly. So this is a, you know, what we're talking about is an extremely important topic. Extremely important for us to apply to our lives. Extremely important for you to teach to your children as you start studying the Bible and getting into and trying to figure out what does it mean and what does it mean to me? How do I apply it? Um, okay, those are two key assumptions. But this is not at all an intellectual pursuit. You know, as we cannot interpret the Bible correctly without the help of the Holy Spirit. And so, we all need God, the Holy Spirit, to come along and teach us these things. This is, these are spiritual truths that we need to come to God and say, Lord, help me to understand this. I know I have biblical laws I need to apply. That's my, that's my part of the partnership in studying the Word. I need your help, Lord, to help me to understand and, and that I truly want to know what you mean. And I need your Holy Spirit that's living inside me to guide me. And uh, just as I've got there this verse, uh, now we have received not the spirit of the world, uh, which is of, uh, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He wants to freely give us the truth and the true meaning. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us to do that. The, uh, let's, let's, um, look at Bible study basics. There's four areas that, that when we're studying the Bible that we should focus on. We're looking at number two, but number one is observation. You read the Bible and your first thing you're doing is, what does it say? What do I see? Do I see a command? Do I see a promise? Do I see a contrast? Do I see an illustration? What do I see? That's actually a lot of fun to do, is just looking at what do I see? Many times we just jump right into, what does it mean? But the first step is, what do I see? The second step where we're focusing on is, the interpretation area is, what does it mean? What's the meaning of that passage? Looking at all that information. The third area is correlation. How does this relate to the rest of what the Bible says on this topic? You know, you read one passage over here and you think, ah, oh, I got it figured out. And then you go along and you read another passage and another passage and you start to build more of a three-dimensional understanding of what a passage means as we continue to study it. And then the final area, application, what does it mean to me? So what does God want me to do? That's the bottom line is how does God want me to change my life and become more like Him based upon my studying the Word of God? The goal of studying the Word of God is not just to gain knowledge, but is to become more Christ-like. That's our aim, our goal ultimately, that we're trying to do. Okay, so let's look at, um, we're going to look at only one law today. One law. And I picked this one because I think it's a very important one. And it's that Scripture should be taken literally. It should be taken literally. Uh, literal interpretation, in, uh, it should be li we should take it literally in the context, in context is the only true interpretation. So when, when we read the Bible in context, we take it literally, and if we, in order to truly understand what is going on. If, if you don't take the Bible literally, you can come up with all kinds of twisted conclusions. Very easily. 
uh, common errors when we don't take the Bible literally is we spiritualize a passage, we, we turn it into a myth, we assume symbolic meaning, we, uh, we, we look at it as metaphors, figures of speech, but not the literal meaning. You know, when we live day to day and I talk, we talk to each other, we take each other literally. You know, if I said I had, I had a great week, I went and visited my, my cousin. You would take it literally and say, well, you visited your cousin. Okay, what was his name? His name is Bobby. Okay, I take that literally. You have a cousin named Bobby. That's how we live. That's how we should look at the Bible. We t what, what do I see? What is the obvious meaning there? Now, of course, there are times when, when God uses figurative language, and so there are passages that are clearly to be understood as a figurative, like when Jesus says, I am the door. Well, we know he's not literally a wooden door. But he's using figurative language in order to explain a, a literal, a, a truth, a reality that's there. And, and so parables, many times, provide us that, that kind of way to understand spiritual truth that we can't catch without that figurative language. Um, here's an example. I'm out, in the, I'm out in the sea. I'm in my boat. There's a huge storm going on. Was that Joaquin? Was that the one that just came by? I'm in the middle of that, that hurricane. And I'm taking on water. And I'm, I'm sinking. And so I get on my radio and I, and I just call out to anybody and I say, I am sinking. Tell them my coordinates and everything. Okay? I hope that they take that literally. Because what if the Coast Guard didn't take that literally? What if the Coast Guard took it figuratively? What if the Coast Guard thought, hmm, uh, it sounds like this man is struggling with depression and he is sinking in a load of troubling thoughts due to the storms in his life. I don't need a psychiatrist right now. I need a rescue boat. You know, you, that sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? But it's if you don't take the Bible literally, you can end up with far-fetched kind of conclusions that totally go off track to the true meaning and you make a wrong application. In this case, if the, if the Coast Guard didn't take me literally, the application they would make would be totally not in my favor. And, um, and so, when we don't take it literally, when you read a passage and you don't want to take it literally, you've got to ask yourself a couple of questions. Am I not taking it literally because uh, I don't want to obey what it says? Hey, I read it and I just don't want to obey that. No, no, that's, that's too far. I'm not going there. That may be one motive. Or maybe it doesn't fit what you've been taught. Maybe it doesn't fit your worldview. Maybe you grew up a certain way and you believe this is the way it is. This is how my parents taught me. This is the truth. I'm not deviating from it. I trust my mom and dad. Who's the ultimate authority though? It's God's word. So you have to, when you study the Bible, when I study the Bible, we have to be willing to put those things aside and say, am I willing to put myself under the authority of God and read the word, take it literally for what it says, and, and then ask myself, where do I fit into this? And, and so we've got to be able to do that in order to truly study the word of God. And, um, and so this is important. So let's look at a case in point. Let's go back to Genesis. Um, and um, Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to go through some scripture that is very familiar about creation, specifically about Adam and Eve. And we're going to use this as a case study on taking the Bible literally. 
and see what we come up with. Genesis chapter 1, and go to verse 26. And in the first chapter, there it says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, so I read that, and then at the end of the chapter it says, And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, if I were to take this passage literally, I would say that I, someone there, was created in the image of God, you know, to be Adam as we go on a little bit further in the text, and he was created on the sixth day. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. That's the literal interpretation. And then go to Genesis chapter 2. Go to the next chapter. And go to verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so if I read that, if you take it literally, okay, where was, how did Adam get formed? What do I see there? Ask him. What do you think? Dust, dust of the ground. Literally, God took the dust of the ground and he created Adam. That's what it says. I submit myself to the authority of God's word that that's how God did it. He could do it any way he wanted to, but that's what the text says. Now go to the um, uh, same chapter. Let's go to verse 18. And we'll read 18 through 24. And let's see what happens. So we've got Adam created. Starting in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a, a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. I'll tell you, Adam must have had an amazing creative mind to come up with the names of everything. He was an intelligent man. Uh, verse 20, And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet or right for him. Verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs he cl and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. By the way, that's the beautiful definition of marriage right there. And uh, now let's go over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, but before I do that, let's see, let me ask you the question. How did Eve get created? Mm -hmm. From, Adam's rib. From Adam's rib. One of Adam's rib caused him to go into a deep sleep. He took his, one of his ribs, and from that rib he created the woman. That's the literal interpretation of that passage. Now if you go to Genesis um, chapter 3, verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree uh, to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now we know previously God had restricted eating from this tree and they went ahead and ate. So they disobeyed God. Here is an act of disobedience I take it literally that it was an act of disobedience by Adam and Eve. And by the way, verse 20 of chapter 3 says, And God called his wife's name Eve. That's where we get. Adam named his wife, he, called, he named her woman. It's interesting that God gave her a personal name, Eve, just as God gave Adam a personal name. It just shows you how personal God is. Has personal names for us. 
That's how much he loves us. Created in his image and all. And so, uh, based on a literal interpretation of this passage, I can say God created man on the sixth day. I can say that. God created Adam and Eve who were the first two people in the world from what I read here. Nobody else, just those two. Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. The woman, or Eve, came from Adam's rib, one of Adam's ribs. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. This sounds like a, a, you know, a children's book, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, but, but the base, this sounds so, so basic, but this is, this is an incredible area of dispute going on in the world. This simple, literal interpretation of what I'm, I'm going to here. Um, there today, this interpretation, not only today, but it, it's been going on for a long, long time, is challenged with the assertion that evolution is the true reality, not the creation by God as it is clearly laid out in Scripture, literally. It is a, it is a rational view. You know, really there's three areas when we, in terms of authority, that we have to decide we're going to place ourselves under. We either are going to place ourselves under the Scriptures, we're either going to place ourselves under some sort of tradition, or we're going to place ourselves under some sort of rational thinking, intellectual thinking, or reasoning that we come to. One of those three. But ultimately, the highest court of appeals is not what we think logically is the right answer, but what does the Bible say? Okay? Not the tradition that I was raised in and all, but what does the Bible say? The evolutionist says, this is baloney. The evolutionist would say that God created man on the sixth day? No, billions of years. That's what the evolutionist would say. God created Adam and Eve who were the first two people in the world. Can't be two distinct individuals under evolution. Matter of fact, from studying a little bit, I have the, the closest they can think of a people groups being formed from evolution is hundreds of thousands of homo sapiens. Not two distinct individuals. Can't get there with evolution. When they, when they start from here and try to move back through the gene pool, they can never get to two individuals. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't two individuals, but when you're starting from this point and trying to go back and re reverse engineer it, they can't get there. Because if they have, they have, their highest court of appeal is their rational thinking. Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. Symbolic. A symbolism. Woman, Eve, came from one of Adam's ribs. Symbolism. Symbolic. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, a myth. Disobeyed God? There wasn't an Adam and Eve under evolution. Disobeyed God? Doesn't make sense. And, and so you can see the attack that people are under. And uh, without a literal interpretation, Let's look at the implications of that. Turn to Romans chapter 5. And we'll be ending here. <clears throat> the stakes are extremely high when this happens. Romans chapter 5, go to verse 12. Paul wrote, Wherefore, as by one man, notice that one man, 
sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, if I don't take Genesis literally, this passage here makes no sense. What do you mean? There was no one man. There was no one man for sin to enter the world, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned, because there's not a one man. Evolution teaches there is no one man. You can't get there. So this is irrelevant. This is false. Look at Romans 5, 18 through 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all to the condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So you look at that. Now I have to interpret that. If, my, if I interpret Genesis in a symbolic, metaphoric way, and then I come to Romans here, and it says through, the, uh, through one man's disobedience, well that doesn't make sense, there wasn't one man uh, sin, uh, many were made sinners, then through the obedience of one, many were made righteous. Why do I need the other one? Who's the other one? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ becomes irrelevant because there was never a literal Adam in order for there to be literal disobedience, in order for there to be literal sin, in order to come into the world with a death sentence of physical and spiritual death makes no sense. There is no need in an evolutionary model for a righteous act of God to pay the price for the sin. Can you see the implications of the interpretation? The Coast Guard making the wrong, ridiculous call? Making the most ridiculous call here makes Jesus Christ irrelevant. For, turn last passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. <clears throat> First Corinthians fifteen forty five. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first Adam. There is no first Adam. The last Adam? There's no need for the last Adam to become a quickening spirit. Jesus Christ merely becomes a man in history who lived with no redemptive purpose under the evolutionary model. You see, if we don't interpret Genesis correctly, it pollutes everything about salvation. Does that make sense? Do you see that? Can you see how not taking the Bible literally, interpreting it correctly, throws you into a, a, a tailspin. And I've read some evolutionists who have pointed this out, who have said it makes salvation, the whole redemptive system, irrelevant. They've come to that logical conclusion, if this is correct. And so I exhort you, I exhort myself, to yield ourselves to the literal, obvious interpretation of what the scriptures teach. Because if you don't, the ramifications go on and on and on and will lead you down paths that will throw you into all kinds of weird things. And uh, leads people to hell. Because they, they have submitted themselves to the authority of man's intellect and reasoning and not to the authority of the simple word of God. And this is what you need to, how you need to study. This is how you need to teach your children. Obey this basic principle. Now there are many, many other principles to look at. This is a, this is a key one, and I wanted to bring this one up. And uh, so that's, that's the lesson that I had for you today. I, I think we're, anybody, have any questions or thoughts or uh, just two, 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 yeah yeah.
I always wanted to uh, <laughs> ask you about this question when I was listening to your lecture. I mean, the, about a little interpretation, actually. Let's, for example, God told us to keep, his, keep a Sabbath holy, right? Right. I remember when I was in you know, junior high, high school, so I could get a little, little and I, you know, God said, oh, I should not work on Sunday. So I decided not to even study, you know, on Sunday because that's part of the work that God is doing, I think. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. And that, that moves into another principle of interpretation. And, and, and the, the principle there is, when who is he talking to when he said to keep the Sabbath holy? He was talking to Israel. See, he wasn't talking to the church. And so there is a biblical law that, that when we enter into the New Testament, we look at what the Old Testament teaches. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, every one of those commandments is instructed in the New Testament except one, the Sabbath. It's a new covenant, and it's a new dispensation in terms of how God is dispensing what he's doing in the world through the body. And so... In the area of the Sabbath, you know, you read on, it says one day considers one day holy unto him, another one doesn't. You know, he talks about it in, in, in Romans. And so when you start to read the scriptures, you start to, there are other laws of interpretation about, I need to see what all does the Bible teach about the Sabbath. I also need to see who's the audience that he's talking to and understand he's talking to Israel. Also, you recognize with Israel, if Israel obeyed God, they were physically what? Blessed. If they disobeyed his, uh, God, they were physically what? Cut off. Nowadays, if a Christian obeys God, what happens to them? Persecution. See, a different dispensation. And so, if I read the Old Testament, kids, be careful about this, if you're rebellious against your parents, what did they do, what did they do to that child? Stoned. Bad news, stoned, right? Okay. So, you know, you have to, uh, you know, are we offering sacrifices in the temple? You know, you go on and on and on. It's a great question, but, and it's an important one to be, know how to, how to interpret for Israel what was for Israel and what is for the body of Christ. And that's another lesson to talk about, about those principles that are there. And that, and that helps guide me to, to understand how to live. Whether, am I living as an Israelite or am I living as a child of God as, the body in the, as a member in the body of Christ? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just close this in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time in your, uh, in your word. Looking at, at taking literally what you say in the scriptures. Lord, help us to be men and women your children who submit ourselves to your authority. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks.